In this video we're going to look at the inverting amplifier and find out how easy it is to design circuits using a simple operational amplifier chip and a few other components. Operational amplifiers are very cheap and widely available. They come in many forms including the familiar dual inline formats as well as surface mount packages. This makes them an obvious choice for many circuits. The operational amplifier is generally depicted on circuit diagrams using a triangle as we see here. Probably the most notable attribute of the op-amp is its very high gain. It may be anywhere from 10,000 upwards, and that's as near to infinity as we need for most calculations. The op-amp also has a very high input impedance, and a low output impedance. For many applications, the input impedance can be considered as infinite, and the loading on the previous stage ignored. And the output impedance considered as zero, and again, it can usually be ignored. If a signal is applied to the non-inverting input, it will come out at the output in the same sense as it appears at the input. In other words, an increasing input level on the non-inverting input will result in the output level increasing. Conversely, a signal applied to the inverting input will appear 180 degrees out of phase. It's inverted and any increase on the input will cause the output to fall. Looking at the voltage gain, Let's take the basic op-amp. If we put a signal in of, let's say, 1 volt peak to peak, and if we see an output signal of 5 volts peak to peak, the voltage gain is V out over V in, so we can see that the voltage gain is 5 over 1, 5 divided by 1, which is 5. In the case of the inverting amplifier, we see a voltage of minus 5 volts for a 1 volt input, so the gain is minus 5. Here we see the circuit configuration for the inverting amplifier. It has two resistors connected to the op-amp chip. R1 is connected to the inverting input, the non-inverting input is connected to ground, and R2 provides a feedback path between the output and the input. It's very easy to calculate the voltage gain. It's simply R2 divided by R1. There's also a minus sign in there because it is an inverting amplifier. So let's take an example of designing an amplifier with a gain of 10. We could choose R1 to be 1K, and this would then mean that R2 is 10K, 10 times R1, to give us the gain of 10. And here we see the values added to the circuit diagram. A key issue with any circuit is its input impedance. So let's go back a stage and see what we can learn. It's obvious that the non-inverting input is at ground potential, simply because it's connected to ground. But this is actually very important because if the amplifier output was, let's say, 5 volts, and the gain of the op-amp itself was 10,000, and they're actually often much more than that, the difference between the two inputs of the IC would be 5 volts divided by 10,000, or much more than 10,000, and that's actually a very small voltage. This point is virtually at ground potential. If the inverting input is at a virtual earth potential, then the input resistance must be equal to R1, because it's connected between the input and ground. So in our design, if we don't want the input resistance of 1K, we simply make it the value we want, and then recalculate the value of R2 to give us the right gain. Power supplies are also important. Normally op-amps run from a positive and negative supply. If you have a dual power supply with plus and minus voltages, that's great. You'll typically need voltages of plus and minus 10 or 12 volts. If you run it off less, then you won't be able to get such a large output swing, but there again, that may not be needed. Typically you need a supply to be a volt or so more than the maximum output from the op-amp. You can also run the circuit from a single supply by creating a half supply point. It then looks to the op-amp as if it has the plus and minus supplies. In the diagram, R3 and R4 are normally the same value, often around 10k or possibly a little bit more, to make a potential divider with half the voltage. C1 then decouples this point to ground. As the input and output will be sitting at half the supply voltage, you'll need to arrange input and output capacitors. 
it's necessary to think of the low frequency cutoff point. The low frequency break point occurs when the reactance of C2 is the same as the resistance of R1. The reactance of the capacitor is simply 1 upon 2 pi Fc, and then with a bit of rearranging this enables us to calculate the value of the capacitor. Let's take the break point as 100 Hz and the input resistor as 1K. Plug the values in and if our arithmetic is correct this means that the capacitor should be about 1.6 microfarads. Let's make it at least 2 so that we easily achieve our aim. So a few hints and tips. First, don't make the value of R2 too high. It's often best to keep the value down to no more than 100K. Sometimes you can go a little bit above this, but it's generally ideal not to. Don't make R1 too low. We saw that this equaled the input resistance, so very often we don't want a very low input resistance. Don't make the gain of an individual stage too high, otherwise the bandwidth may be limited. But that's a topic for another video. 10 to 20 is probably a good figure, and maybe 50 absolute tops, dependent upon the requirements. Designing with op amps can be very simple. This simple amplifier works well and can be easily used to provide excellent performance using just a cheap op amp chip.